1954, when my youngest brother Richard was an eighth grader at Baker Middle School in Troy, and I was a junior at college at Alma, he was injured in a hunting accident over here about nine miles in the woods. He ran to the house with a horrible wound in his face. They took him to the doctors. They didn't know if he'd live. He was in the hospital for 43 days. They patched him back with his jaw and with plastic surgery rebuilt his chin and his lips. My father at the time had a seizure with his heart and was down with his back. So in the working at his lumber yard where he worked, they made these first two benches. They were intended to be used as a utility bench. They did not uh, correspond with the accident, but they became later called the healing bench. And my son James created this drawing to have it have some uh, on paper. And I wrote this small article about what the bench means to me. And I give it to folks in the family at all ceremonies, such as high school graduations, weddings. That was the first intent. But then it became known as the healing bench for folks who needed healing, otherwise handicapped children, a six-year-old boy with leukemia, a 60-year-old man with pancreatic cancer, an army sergeant who came back from the war thinking that his own little son was the enemy, on and on with folks who need healing. Then the connection came to an alternative high school here in town because that school has 190 needy children who need physical, emotional, and financial assistance. They liked the bench for its use. They also used it as a symbol of hope in the school. And ironically, the principal used it as a, a disciplinary item saying to a boy who is a character in the school, take this and go home and sit on it and come back tomorrow. That kind of thing. Now the bench has become a wholesale uh, thing in their school lobby where anyone who comes there, anyone, including the children, the staff, the parents, a visitor, can pick up a bench and leave with it. That's the major use now. It is, to me, my mission after retirement. It is made of all kinds of wood from piano benches to tables to barn wood to cherry trees cut down in a man's yard to flooring all kinds of wood. Otherwise, it's made of me a wood scavenger. And I have had great luck with barn wood, especially. The students like that one. But folks, take the bench willingly, even though I have been uh, refused by a couple or three persons who didn't want a bench. That's okay by me, because it, it is intended for their personal use. It gets used as a utility bench mostly, but I did receive from the soldier who thought his own three-year-old son was the enemy a picture of the boy sitting on the bench and the soldier standing behind him. So did it help him with the boy, with himself? I think so. That's the hope of healing and goodness of the bench. Very nice. A few shots from here. This is bench number one, made by my father. Number two is in the garage, 
It's been used as a utility bench and shows all the rigors of saw and paint and so on. This one, though, is in the hands of my youngest brother who was shot in that accident. He has it at home. It's pristine just like it was. When I was giving a bench, folks wanted to know about it, so I wrote this small narrative about the accident, about how it was intended to be used, and what I think it can provide for folks, including stability, financial, goodness, thrift, faith, hope, all of those things. And then I record for them the number. And I like to give the number because it helps me keep track of what I'm doing. And folks refer to it that way. I do not sign them. I do not sell them. And anybody who wants to ask me for one can have one. I have been asked by some folks for five at a time. The five at a time that I best remember was a lady whose husband walked away and left the family. She wanted five and then told me that she wanted one for him, for his parents, for her parents, and the two children involved. That, I thought, was an extraordinary request and a use for a bench of hope. I, I, I was humbled by that request. Giving them to members of the family means that they're across the country, from California to Massachusetts to Florida, to Wisconsin, and two or three in Austria across the ocean. That's how far the bench goes. I send them to folks by UPS because a UPS merchant in the area gives me a good assistance with the boxing and the mailing. I also now have assistance from local merchants for the wood when they heard about the story of the bench. And when I do accept wood from such as might be Home Depot, I always take for their employees two or three benches each time that I gain wood from them and they put them in their lunchroom or give them to their employee who's hurting emotionally or physically, that's a good faith thing also. This is the graduation of June 29 for the local alternative high school that is made up of 190 students of great need. They graduate about 40 this year. They struggle to get a diploma. They get quite often emergency grant money to help them with their lo local problems. One of the churches locally gave every one of the 40 of them a $300 grant to go to a junior college here in town. And some of those kids who, well, they said to me, why me? I never got anything in my life. One other one said, oh, I'll put that with grandpa's money and I'll take two classes. This man is the superintendent of school who saw the benches, believes in the faith and the hope and the healing of them, has them in his home, and gave this great speech to the graduating class about the subject of graduation and hope and healing. This garage is my workshop, both winter and summer. Every bench that I make or have made is made here in this garage or at one time in the basement before I could use the garage. I have no problem with heat in the winter. I just open the house door and let it come out. Or as you can see here today, the door is open and a nice breeze through. 
I work, work only off that pair of workhorses. Very simple. With the tools you see there, normally three drills with electric batteries. And this is the result of some recent work. This one being a miniature one that I'm now making for children because some children kids said they couldn't lift these so they wanted something smaller. This one is made out of a man's oak flooring from his house. My man glued them together, cut the pieces to size, we put it together and stained it golden oak and put a polyurethane on it. This one is made out of an antique drop leaf table from an antique shop. This one is from yellow oak shelving that a man brought here to me after a project that he had a demo, his demolition of a house. This one is made from pine stair steps donated to me by Home Depot. This is bench number two. Otherwise, that was one of my dad's original. And when he passed away in 1986, the bench passed to me, and he said to me, make benches for the family. So I've been doing that. And as far as I know, I have them in immediate family covered. But it, it's it also now, because they're great-grandkids, more and more needing. I need them for graduations, for weddings, within the family, uh, some illnesses, and I've even given them in death. Last week one of my students died. She was estranged from her family. I took five of the benches to her funeral, sought out her family, and gave them one in her memory. I was hoping that they would take it home and at least have a good feeling about their loved one. She was a difficult person to love. This one is made out of the pews from a local church and a stair-step oak on top. This one is made out of cherry from a tree up the way here. A man cut the tree, had it kiln dried, and was giving it to me, and in doing so I found out he was one of my students in 1972. Each one of these has a number. That one's 1230. Uh, they range all the way probably from 700 up to that. to have a barnwood one because I can't keep them on hand. They go so quick. If, if I had them here and gave everybody a choice, they would take the barnwood and go because it makes a beautiful bench. It has the knots, the blemishes, the nail holes, and it's a hundred years old. And that's why folks want it in that case. And I've had some phone calls from various folks in the community wanting a barnwood bench. And actually, barnwood is hard to come by. It's costly, in fact. 
And in that respect of cost, I do have to buy some of this wood that I have, plus I also pay the man who cuts them out. So for me, the bench is not a totally free thing. It is costly in some ways. Uh, I count them as on an average of about $23 to make to buy the wood and make a bench if I bought the wood and and he cut them out for me. Then my own labor, which is a labor of love. Can you tell me about these benches here? These are some that I have recently finished. He had made for me out of the stair steps 14 benches. He now has wood for another 14. That wood is clean white pine and the children at the church do some strange things with them. For instance, they take this hand, drip it in the paint and stick it on the bench and that's how they decorate it. Or they have done such things as put a plastic cover on both sides of this and use that hole as their collection uh, money in church for their fundraisers. This one is a new one that I've been making for young children in hopes that they would have something to go with this. For instance, that becomes a two-piece one. And I, I give it that way in hopes that the family will have a little one who needs a bench to talk about. And that's one of the things with me is, is they talk about the bench, of what it means. I'm not really overly concerned who they got it from because, in fact, I'd like folks that I know to give the bench and not put me in the picture because that's not the big the thing. The big thing is the love coming from a person who's caring about somebody else. Uh, funerals, for instance, that sometimes works that way. I don't wish to be involved. I just let the family give the bench to the one who's really hurting, the one who's made had the loss. This batch is made from yellow pine, stained golden oak, and a polyurethane cover on it. But if you look carefully, it has the nail holes because it was made from a renovation bench out of a person's house. It has the knots. It has the blemish. My grandson calls it the struggles and challenges of life and our grit to endure them. And that's why this one is not a pristine wood. It is from scavenged wood that would have been burned otherwise. And I don't like to see that good wood burned. close-ups of these. It's beautiful. I personally think the nails holes are a uh, indication of something beyond the word hope. Maybe faith is the word. What you see here are the ingredients for the typical bench. Each bench has eight pieces of wood and 28 screws made up of a top, two legs, a bench which fits in this area and four rails. 
an upper and a lower rail. I have already pre-drilled and uh, used a countersink on the lay on the rails to help putting it together. It takes me about 45 minutes to do one. I sand every inch of it. Otherwise my man sands them also in his shop, but I sand them when I put them together totally. Since my eyesight is failing some, I need all the light I can get. So I do have overhead lights in this small light right here where I work. But here in this climate of today, if I were doing one, I would open this door and let that breeze come right through. And off the lake, it comes sometimes this way from the east and the north. And it's a very nice breeze. To my knowledge, every bench that I've made was made on these two sawhorses. If I were making benches today, these would not be here, but my car would be in the garage with the bumper right here so that I don't step backwards off this four inch curb and fall down. So it's my buffer to stand up. What I'm going to do when I can't stand up out here, I'm not sure, but I've had numerous young men who want to take over this job, including your nephew, Grant. And one day I'm going to have him come over and work on them with me. Right here on this shelf, Otherwise, some small, such as scissors, screwdrivers, hammer, recording on which I put the numbers, sandpaper, measuring the screws, and my three or four drills or uh, screwdrivers to put the screws in. The oak ones are difficult to do because the wood is hard. The pine ones, such as out here, are easily to do, easy to do. I try to use wood that is three-quarter inch thick because I don't want the benches to be too heavy for folks to carry and handle. But I've also been making some now out of inch or inch and a quarter, which will make the bench heavier, and it may not have holes in the top. The folks will have to pick it up from the ends. And it may have a, a little bit of a different design because when I give the wood to my fellow who cuts them out, I say to him, use your own judgment on what you can do best with the wood. He always sands the top of it. He always shapes it or cuts it up into various pieces that fit what he's trying to put together. Sometimes when I get the bench, I don't recognize the wood that I had given to him. And every time I get it, it's wrapped in brown or black paper with the name on the package of what it is. If it's a top, he labels it tops. If it's legs, he labels it legs. When I get it, I can just go right into making them because everything is labeled and ready for me. Very rarely do I find one that doesn't work or fit. He is an expert. Because he makes picture frames, he wants things to fit. If I find one that doesn't quite fit, 
I have taken liberty with a small saw or other tools to make it fit and I then call it a blemish that goes along with the hope that I hope to give to folks. The screws are two sizes, one and five eighths and two inch screws. And I chose the gold color because that goes with most of the wood that I have here and it does not tarnish very much. I've had many suggestions about how to make a different bench or to improve it. I try to listen to those and I have changed making benches in some respect. If you notice this one, which is the original, is larger than all the others. I stopped making this large one because of the need for the school kids and youngsters to use the bench rather than this bigger one. And then I found the lady who told me this one won't fit in my bathroom. She wanted that one or this one. So that's how I came to making smaller ones. Sometimes I make them out of shelving that is not true wood. It is a prefabbed wood. Even that will make a good bench. If I find such as these shelving units along the side of the road. Somebody's trying to get rid of them. I pick them up and make a bench out of them. I've used this one in more painting projects than I can remember and you can see what I've done to it. I even sawed the corner off of it one time in a, a project with my son-in-law. But that's the original number two right there. I'm giving this one to a lady whose father just passed away. Pancreatic cancer. She also had a brother who at 18 took his own life. With something like that, I have to be careful giving a bench because sometimes it brings back some tough memories. I don't want to do that, but I always hope that it will be a good one. And I think this one will be a good one for her because the legs are made out of the pew from a church and that'll give her a little bit of faith. The wood for this one was given to me by a neighbor man who when I went to his garage sale said, I know you, you whacked me with a paddle. Otherwise I had him in school in the 70s and there he was, giving me that cherry wood to make the bench. I'm going to give it back to him, of course, just like that. I'm also giving him two others. One for his son-in-law, whose wife has breast cancer. And the other one for his uh, the father-in-law in the family, who can't walk a step because he's in a wheelchair. That's the use of inches. One of the recipients of benches now that I am most attuned to are the kids who we call autistic. They sometimes can't converse with you. They can't talk with you. They can't say their own name. They're sometimes brilliant kids, but it's hidden inside of them. And they also won't touch you. They aren't 
prone to shaking your hand or remembering who you are. But with one of those things, it bridges some of that. They will try to say their names. They will talk with you. They will reach out and thank you with their hands. That's the autistic children. Vietnam veterans I try to find that need a bench because society after that war was pretty tough on them and some of them are homeless still today and there is a homeless center down in Pontiac where I have taken the benches and left them with the director and she gives them to the homeless folks who she tries to find a house for them or a, an apartment very honestly, this is nothing more than eight pieces of wood and 28 screws. But a wish for hope and healing and goodness and faith. One little guy said, I just put my shoes on it. So there's a use for it. I'm going to take this one to a neighbor lady who gave me another version of a bench. She said, how about I'll trade you? And so the bench she gave me is in the hands of my man who cuts them out. And he's going to make a version of her bench, which has a lift lid. And I'll be giving it back to her for her children. I'm going to give her that one because she gave me the other one and we made a trade. I've sent them to Austria looking like this, packaged, torn down with the screws and my son puts them together over there in Vienna for the folks that he know needs a little bit of healing or the youngsters in the neighborhood or so. So I, c I can ship one of these overseas, not very expensive at all. One of these here I'm going to ship to Alaska to a young lady who called me on the phone saying her husband just walked away and went to Washington and left her with three children. She needs a bench. It won't help her with her finances. It won't make him come back. It may just be something that she remembers the good days that she and I had at school, which was 45 years ago. Would you like to put one together? Sure, that'd be great. All right, the, the beginning point for putting them together would be the legs and the two lower rails. That's the first bit of material. The two rails will hold the legs together and we'll put a bench in between as we work. I usually keep my screws there so I can reach out and get them easily. The task is fairly simple. Since I've already pre-drilled these, I would have taken about 10 minutes to do it. But I wanted to get them so that you and I could do this today. 
my most difficult thing is to make these rails and that leg smooth without doing that or without doing that. I want it to be as smooth and as nice as I can. And since I'm a bit shaky with my hands now, I have some difficulty doing that. I use this short handle hammer to get a good start and a power drill to sink that screw and you notice I have trouble getting the power drill in the screw because of my shakiness step number one Same thing on this side. These could be made more fancy and different designs and so on, but I wanted to stick as close as I could to my dad's original design. Which I am in my own mind thinking might not have been his because he worked in a lumber yard as a laborer shoveling coal not making benches and I think he may have said to the mill man there make me a couple of benches I'm not sure how that came about my dad never shared that with me but since my dad was not a carpenter I think that may have happened then we need a bench. Always looking at the bench to see which is the best side because this is wood straight out of a lumber yard and it is not expensive. This piece of wood for 10 feet costs about $13. You could buy the next grade up that would cost $25. I don't do that because the, the cost of the bench is already sometimes a an item. You see he's already made it so that that bench will fit between the two legs and is ready for the next railing. Grant, most youngsters could do exactly this job for me. In fact, they would improve the, the system and the speed of it. I'm slow, methodical. I've put the screw in the top hole of that lower railing because that's what I want to do now is to hold the legs together and you see the bench is already there and stable. It would not be strong enough for daily use if I just put the lid on it and quit. Now it needs more work such as I like to fasten the bench to the railing like that. And I do that by two more screws, five inches from the end, five inches from the end. And then I come to the drilling part of this that takes a little time. And I know my screw is going down into that bench. If I make my hole too high, I miss the bench. If I make it too low, it misses the bench. So I have to, over time, have judged that. And then because I want the screws to be countersunk, I do this step. 
which in softwood is no problem. If that were oak, I'd have a, a greater struggle with it. But oak is good to work with because it makes a nice bench. Barn wood is easy to work with too because it's soft and sometimes is a hundred years old. You see that screw holds the rail to the bench and every time I put a screw in it tightens up or strengthens the bench. Honestly when I was making some of the early benches I didn't put enough screws or pay enough attention to strength and one lady sat on her bench and it collapsed and I didn't want that happening. Ordinarily, and I won't do it today, I would now sand every bit that's facing me. The top of this, the top of that, these rails, I even sand the legs, I sand this, I sand every inch of the bench early stages I was not sanding them and then I was realizing that I was giving out a bench that could get uh, splinters in some hands or wasn't smooth enough to finish because I want folks to be able to finish these if they like to. So I do now sand every part of the bench. I won't do it today because I can sand this later. We need to do the other side of the rail same procedure. These kids with the PhDs from high school can surely do this, can't they? In fact, I'm looking forward to turning Grant loose on it because I think he'll have some help for me on how to do this. Quicker and better. On the other hand, I can't imagine why the teenagers, with all the things they have going on in their life right now, would want to stand here at this saw horses and make a bench all day, which I have done. I could make ten a day if I really worked at it. I don't wish to. I try to do about five. I, I do have a life other than the bench. Although very honestly, not much of one. Because I cannot now cut grass. I can't go out there and clean my garden. A man is doing that for me. I can't do much about the house. She does have me still with the dishes and the floors because I can do that with my balance. In reality, this bench making is my work, my mission. I would be sanding this side. Then because I think the shelf needs a little support from the end, I turn it and put one more screw in the bench itself. Merely by making myself a mark, drilling another hole which goes right into the bench itself and holds it from the end. I don't want that lady having a collapse of her bench again. See that screw is tying the leg to the end of the bench, therefore strengthening it 
If we didn't strengthen it, it would wobble. And, as the lady found out, it would collapse. So we have to make it as strong as we can. Between Grant and I, it is not going to be the bench or the bench making. It's going to be between John and Grant getting further acquainted and caring about each other. I will say at first when I met Grant, I couldn't do it. We weren't making it. Grant was a distance from me. I didn't quite know how to approach him. We made it. And it's easy now, and I'm really looking forward to when he helps me with the benches, how close we might come. And from the looks of his room at home, he'll be good at it. Because he's proud of himself and of his surroundings. He'll make a great bench maker. I have a grandson in a wheelchair who wants to come in the next week or so and bring his aide, who is another boy, and they want to try this. Well, Jack in the wheelchair can't do much of anything. The most he could do is hand the pieces to the rest of us, and he can't do that very well. He might be able to sand some, but such as with Grant, it isn't the bench, it's the companion, companionship and getting together and, and him coming all the way from Howell with his aide to here, leaving his mom there and getting out into freedom a little bit because he needs, well, that's what he calls it, freedom. He's been able to go to college a year. He's been able to shoot an elk in the woods. Jack has grit. He could do this. Now we have it to that stage. And if I were spending the time, I would have sanded it all again. And we're ready for the next set of rails, which I call the top rails. And they're going to support that thing, which is the top. This set of rails is drilled like the others, but it also has an extra set of holes, three in each, to allow me to fasten the top to the bench. And that's how it's done, through those six holes. Screws down through that. And the procedure to drill these holes was very simple, such as drilling a hole and countersinking it a little bit. this alignment problem and if you should look closely you'd see that I'm off by about three-eighths of an inch which means that I either have to squeeze the thing to get it in line or take a set of vice grips to it or something but I'm able to do this one by hand and then you can see, because of my shakiness, I can't get the, this in the screw. So I have to stop and do another procedure, and that's to cheat a little bit. My grandson's motto in life in that wheelchair, when he fails, 
is to say, if all else fails, Grandpa, cheat. Otherwise, he's saying it honestly, but find some other way, you know, get, get a vice grip or get somebody to hold it for you or if you can't do it yourself, cheat. Now you see we have something to put the top on. And we do this other one and, and the top is doing. And that's what we'll do. We'll put the other one on. Notice that my man, when he cuts this out, shapes the edges with a router. Every one of them. The tops, the legs. He shapes every piece that he gives me. He doesn't just saw and put it in a package. He takes a lot of time. He wants it to be as good a product as we can put out. In between this attaching these, I would be sanding every piece. For instance, after I put this last screw, I would sand all of this again or get it to a satisfactory smoothness. It's getting stronger, but because I don't think it's strong enough, I'm going to put that extra screw in this part of the bench that will keep it from doing that. And to do that, I use a longer screw because I want it to go deep into this leg. That will strengthen it very well. Sanding again, every I, I would sand each of these spots so that there isn't a rough or a uh, an edge that couldn't be stained or used by a child or it's important to me to have a, a decent finished product because I wasn't proud of the ones I did years ago in that respect. My battery is getting weak and I'm always having to keep them charging. Uh, normally I have one in there that's this size that would be charging. I haven't done that here carefully. but. Where did I get these tools? I bought them at a garage sale for a guy that from a guy that was no longer needing them. They aren't expensive. I probably paid five dollars for the whole mess of them. The batteries came with them. They la they've lasted me about five years now. And occasionally I buy a new one. We would do some more sanding. That's good and strong now, ready for the top.
notice that the top has two holes. The original, my dad's, had only one. It has two now because a neighbor down the way who wanted to make one of these benches picked that up and when he did it twisted in his hand. He said if twisting it in your hand could be changed by having two holes, it doesn't twist and that makes it an easier thing anyway. So I don't make any more with one holes, they're all with two. Now when I come to the top, I look at both sides to see which is the prettiest or which one is the best. And on this wood, I think I would like this to be the top because it is very clean and not doesn't have any gouges in it, even though that might stain and be a nice one. But what I would do then, if that were my top, I would sand it quite a bit. I like to put quite a bit of work into sanding the top. All the edges. And because folks are going to use their hands in there, I do the those holes just like so. about that much, then a reverse, now that's, that's the top that's going to show, the other side that doesn't, I could just leave it and not do anything, but my own personal choice is that I finish this side as nicely as the other and because you and I are going to put this together and I can't sand it later I'm going to sand it right now and let you see what I mean by sanding the top the edges of it it's already been sanded by the man who cuts them out but I like to shape it a little more In the long run, this would take about 45 minutes to an hour to do a bench. In the winter here, I keep the garage door closed. I open that door and let the house air come out into here. And I have a small little heater that I can set out here somewhere. And I usually get up to about 60 degrees in the garage in the winter. And that's best for me anyway. That's better than this 75 that we're doing right now. Or 80. None of this would be necessary if I just gave the bench away to somebody. But pride-wise, I don't care to give it away without having sanded it, spent a little time in it. Because I do feel what I give to folks should have a good appearance, should be smooth, and it should be a part of me, and a part of me is my work. The sanding could be done with a hand sander. I, because I'm clumsy, have not chosen to do it that way. But I could do it easier, I think, than I am now. But because of 
fumbling with another machine and electrical cords, I've chosen to do it this way. Ironically, I don't want the bench to be an easy thing anyway. I want it to be something that I have put something into. Some finances, some labor, and sometimes just plain old willpower. Okay, we have a top that's sanded and ready. I normally don't measure anything to make sure I get the top on square or right. I just sight what uh, looks nice, look at the other side and see if it's about the same as this side, ready for screws. And it's the longer screws that I use to hold it in place. The holes that I'm putting these screws in have been pre-drilled and countersunk to handle this screw, which is a two-inch screw. If I used a two-and-a-half inch screw, it would go all the way through the top and ruin it. If I used the one and five-eighths, it wouldn't be long enough to hold the top to the bench. So I have settled on a two-inch screw for the tops. <clears throat> so far, that's been okay. <coughs> Normally, this drill tightens that up really good, but because I have an older drill bit now and I'm a little shaky with my hands, I always test each one of the screws with a hand screw to make sure that I got it as tight as it would go. That one needed some tightening. Some tightening. Not much, but that, those screws will hold. They're in there about a little over a half of an inch. Three more screws and we've got this one almost whipped. That's almost it. One other step. That's numbering it. I keep this sheet of paper, which has my numbers on it. My last one that I did was number one, two, three, oh, so this is one, two, three, one. It's made out of stair. Then I cross it off to say that I've made that one. And I've got to remember the number is 1231 one because I'm going to write it on here and I usually write it in the very same spot and that's right here. I didn't write it there because of the knot and I only always do it by hand. A friend of mine gave me a burning 
tool to burn that on there and he said put your name and I tried one and I had to, I had to heat stuff I had two more steps to do I didn't like the number as well as this and I didn't want my name on it anyway because it, this bench isn't John Acton this bench is whoever gets it I have put some of these in live auctions for charities raising money. They've gone for as high as $90. A couple of times they didn't sell for 20 So that's the difference in the charity thing. But I would not sell one. One more step. Just a little bit of sanding feel around the edge to the top. And then because the hole it was not sanded really from within, I give it a little bit of touch. Not necessary, but in my mind. Here we are. Other than sanding it, it's completed. Number one, two, three, one. I will sand it, and that's easy to do. Hi. We just built a bench. We had fun doing it, too. I'm going to leave that one set right there because I'll have to sand it yet. Even if I never touched it with a sandpaper, it's in good shape because he already did it. But I like to sand these rough edges right there and some of the other spots. Wonderful. something that somebody like me put together in fact it it's already proven to be handy for me I take the parts out of my car and I set them on it and then from that I work to here it's kind of a workbench that doesn't take up much space that may become a bench and I don't know exactly what the man will do with it but you see that's oak it's the oak door from a kitchen he could either make the bench that size and cut the holes here or he could saw the rail off let this be the rails and use this as the bench but that's good oak. In fact, you couldn't buy oak. It's already stained and finished like that. I'm not sure how... I'm not sure he'll want to uh, go to all the work for it. I have about ten pieces like this. Some larger, some smaller. But that was somebody's kitchen door. If he made it just out of this top, he would trim the edges, cut me the holes, and that becomes the top. It doesn't fit the sizes that I've been making, but I don't care about that. A bench is a bench to me.
there's one other element about the benches that I don't mention but it's one that's quite pleasurable to me is that I quite often get a thank you card from the folks and some of them are beyond they make me cry some of them you know the little six-year-old with the leukemia his grandmother or the well the guy with the pancreatic cancer was a bricklayer his daughter-in-law asked me for a bench for him because he was he had quit work wouldn't come out of his bedroom shut the door and went in she took the bench gave it to him he took it in the room shut the door the next morning he got up got his tools and went back to work he only lasted two more months and died but whether the bench had anything at all to do with coming out of that room or going back to work, I don't know. But that's what she felt. So the bench served a purpose for her. Ironically, her family had given me the wood out of which I made this bench. So it went to a man in the family who had given up hope in life. When he picked up his tools and went back to work, I think for a few days he had a little more hope. That's what the bench is about. They have a free pantry that's on the outside of the church where folks can drive up to the church, <coughs> open up the little doors and get canned food and stuff. I'm going to put one of these in there and see how long it lasts to see if somebody wants a bench out of the food pantry. It'll fit just nicely in there. The pantry was made by two girls as their confirmation project. They fitted it together, screwed it to the wall, and they keep it stocked with canned goods that folks can help themselves to. Right there in the church entryway area. Ruth just sent one like that one on the end over there with the cherry edges to Florida and the fundraiser for my grandson's research outfit sold it in a live auction. It probably drew between 20 and 30 or 40 dollars. To me that's the best use of it that I can think of is that it's in the family it went in a long way journey and if one dollar will cure that horrible disease it's worth every bit of it and the irony is that wood was given to me by the boy up the way here who I whacked with a paddle in school so he said I don't remember it I'm giving him back one of the benches because he said to me one day about his time at school with me, I was no good, was I? I said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I wasn't any good. And I said, no, you, you must not you know, have that feeling. I don't remember I whacked you with a paddle. But up here he owns 10 acres, a beautiful house, three pole barns, filled with equipment, tractors, trailers. He's got a beautiful garden. Yes, he was some good. I'm going to give that bench back to him to remind him. That bench is this one here on the end? The one on the end, yeah. That's cherry wood that he and his son-in-law cut right out of the backyard. 
my man had to glue some of it a little bit to get a full piece. I think he glued it together. But he left the rough edges at my request. And sometimes the rough edge has a knot in it or a, a bulge or so. This one just happens to be somewhat smooth. I like the rough edges ones. I like the barnwood ones. My, one of my favorites is the one made out of that flooring down on the end there. If I stained or put polyurethane on these, it would take as long as it did for me to build that one. So it would take about an hour and a half to two hours to make this bench, or that bench, or this bench. Whereas this one, without the stain and the polyurethane, it would take only an hour. Sometimes when I have a personal tough time, I come out here I sit on my dad's bench contemplate life that helps association with my dad or with somebody who cared for me a piece of wood and with some screws or nails and the future and if you read those notes that I have it talks about the future Last week we had a funeral for one of my special education students. She was not a very talented or popular person in life, somewhat estranged from her relatives, brothers and sisters. At the funeral I took five of these, like that one, and I gave one to each of the family members. My hope was that they would take it away from there in her memory somebody that they couldn't find love for very well because she was a character. It was quite often her reason that they didn't get along. But I wanted them to have something to remember her by. And my memory is seeing them go to their car carrying their bench. 